About a year ago, I was watching some blind speedruns of Pokemon and thought to myself, I bet you could do this without the sound, too. Play the game blind and deaf. But what does that even mean? With no audio or visuals, I'd have no information about what's going on. I'd need to know what to do independent of what's happening in-game. But Pokemon has a lot of RNG. The only way I'd be able to successfully and consistently do this would be if there was some list of inputs, some sequence of buttons I could press that always beats the game, regardless of random chance. If I turn off the visuals and mute the audio from the game, I'd still know what buttons to press so long as the list of inputs accounts for every possibility. This would, essentially, turn Pokemon into a rhythm game. Hit the buttons as they come up, and you win. After a quick Google search returned nothing, I realized that if I wanted to satisfy my curiosity, I'd have to make this list myself. A single sequence of inputs that can handle grass, crits, moving NPCs, dealing too little damage, dealing too much damage, puzzles, the menus, and more. So, without further ado, allow me to introduce you to a year's worth of work. What you just saw is all 230,000 inputs that I've meticulously put together, which, when pressed in order, always beats Pokemon Fire Red. Well, almost always, but I'll get into some of the caveats as we move on. With this list, I can beat the game while blind and deaf. I'll be showing multiple games at a time to showcase how the same buttons can deal with several different possibilities. You can think of this like playing many different games connected to one controller. Very few of these possibilities have lasting impact on the game though, so they will drop in and out as we progress. The start of the game is pretty simple. I prep for the rival battle by getting a potion out of the PC, and then make my way to Oak's lab. One of the first things you might notice is that I'm only taking one step at a time. This is because holding down the lock button isn't very precise. By only taking one step at a time, I can ensure the buttons being pressed are the same every time. It's much easier to press the up button six times than it is to hold the up button for exactly two seconds. There's also an issue with the walk cycle sometimes taking 16 frames and sometimes taking 17 frames, but I don't really want to get into that right now. I picked Charmander as my starter, since Charmander learns Scratch, which is a 100% accuracy move, unlike Bulbasaur and Squirtle, which learn Tackle, a 95% accuracy move. I can't really afford to miss, so using moves with less than 100% accuracy is impossible. Charmander's nature is selected randomly from a pool of 25. Charmander's stats also vary by a random amount. In any scenario, I have to make sure both the weakest Charmander, with the worst stats and least favorable nature, and the strongest Charmander, with the best stats and most favorable nature, both succeed for one sequence of inputs. This basically guarantees that all the Charmanders in between will succeed as well. There's also a random factor in the damage formula that adds some variance, not to mention the chance to crit. Taken all together, all attacks can deal a wide range of damage. Generally. I assume that I'll deal the lowest possible damage, and that the enemy will deal the highest possible damage, to account for the worst case scenario. Keeping this in mind, I enter the rival battle. Charmander has a really high chance to win this battle, since our high base speed means we usually move first. Also, unlike wild Pokemon and gifted Pokemon, enemy trainers Pokemon do not get random stats. They have a fixed value, and Squirtle happens to have the lowest possible stats and an abysmal nature. This, of course, doesn't really stop Squirtle from just critting three times in a row. It doesn't really matter whether I win or lose this battle, but for reasons I'll describe later, it's nice if I can. During the battle, I can just spam A to use Scratch, and on the third turn, I use a potion. After doing millions of simulations, the math says that using a potion here slightly increases Charmander's chance to win. This is the only battle in the entire game that I don't know the outcome of beforehand. This creates two parallel universes, one where Charmander is level 6, and one where Charmander is level 5, and I'll have to make sure any sequence of buttons works for both. Now, it's time for the first real challenge of the run. Grass. 
Well, it's actually not that troublesome. Tall grass introduces an element of randomness. When I walk into a patch of grass, I won't know if a battle has started or not. I deal with this by assuming that every single step starts a battle. All I have to do is use this special sequence of inputs. When I enter a new patch of grass, I wait for a little bit in case a battle is starting up. Then I press B to pass through dialog boxes, but here's where the magic happens. If I'm in a battle, I want to run away, since I can't guarantee that I defeat a wild Pokemon in battle. To do this, I need to press down, right, A. But if I do that, then if I'm not actually in a battle, I'll move my character around, which could potentially start a battle, and that would just recurse infinitely. But if I press start beforehand, then I won't move at all. The start menu will eat the inputs. Then before I press A, I close the menu by pressing start again and run away. And that's all there is to it. Sounds simple enough, right? All I have to do is repeat this sequence of inputs for every blade of grass, and I can make it through just fine. Though, there are two small caveats. Using the start menu to avoid moving means I won't know what option the cursor is on. If I want to open my bag later, I won't be able to navigate to it under these conditions. To fix this, all I have to do is position myself above a wall, and then open the start menu and press down A, B over and over again. Doing this six times in a row guarantees that the cursor will be on exit the next time I open the start menu. The second caveat is that whether or not you can run away is dependent on your speed stat. If you're faster than the enemy, then you get away. If you're slower, there's a chance you can't escape. The slowest Charmanders are outsped by fast Pidgeys in the grass outside Pallet Town, and there's a chance I can't escape. Winning the rival battle helps mitigate this, since Charmander will be faster at level 6, but I can't avoid a slow Charmander that loses the rival battle, not being able to escape, and from there, the run is basically over. The chance that this happens, though, is quite low, at less than a percent, but this is the reason that I can only say that this sequence of inputs almost always beats the game. With the grass taken care of, I can pick up some Pokeballs from Professor Oak, though I can't use them, since there would be no way to tell if I actually caught something. With only Charmander in my party, I can head to Viridian Forest, and from there, Pewter City, where I'll have to defeat Brock. Brock has a level 12 Geodude and a level 14 Onix, and Charmander is weak to Rock. I can't catch any Pokemon to help, which means Charmander will need some training. But I also can't fight any wild Pokemon, I can't control when the fights happen, and wild Pokemon give a variable amount of experience. It would quickly become impossible to tell when Charmander was leveling up. The only source of consistent, noble experience comes from trainer battles, but there's only 7 available trainers between me and Brock, and Charmander needs to hit level 31 and learn Flamethrower before taking on Onyx. Luckily, Bugcatcher Charlie has 2 Metapods, which is the only Pokemon I can guarantee I'll win against right now. When I go to fight Charlie, I have to make sure the sequence of buttons works for both the weakest level 5 Charmander and the strongest level 6 Charmander. I also have to factor in the chance to crit and damage variation. To solve this fight, all I have to do is keep using Scratch, since Metapod can't do anything back. When the first Metapod goes down, both level 5 and level 6 Charmander reach level 7 and learn Ember. Charmanders that get lucky and crit move on to face Caterpie early, but I need them to use Ember. Starting on turn 3, the earliest turn that the strongest Charmander could KO Metapod, I start pressing down before pressing A to select the move. There's no move underneath Scratch until we learn Ember, so this doesn't do anything before we've defeated Metapod, and selects Ember after we do. I also use the start button here to make sure any scenarios where the battle ends quickly don't walk around while the weakest Charmanders catch up. By repeating this sequence of inputs enough times, I can guarantee the fight will be over before I start moving again. And now that Charmander knows Ember, I can defeat the other bug catchers by one hit KOing their Weedles and Caterpies before they have a chance to attack. But there's a big problem. Charmander's only level 9, and needs to hit level 31, which means I'll have to find 24,000 extra experience from somewhere. This is where Doug comes in. Trainer battles provide the consistent experience that I need, but I can only challenge each trainer once. Well, 
Actually, I can only win against each trainer once. If you lose a trainer battle, you pay out some fake money and get sent back to the Pokemon Center you last healed at. Notably, you keep any experience you gained in the battle and can challenge the trainer again. So if I defeat a trainer's first Pokemon and then lose on purpose to their second Pokemon, I can challenge them indefinitely. 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 Doug the bug catcher is the only valid choice for this process. To lose to Doug on purpose, I have to use Growl 30 to 40 times in a row, which takes about 8 minutes. Each time I lose, Charmander gains 78 experience, which means I'll have to lose to Doug over 300 times. In total, this will take about 40 hours. Though some of the other available trainers have multiple Pokemon, Doug is the only one that I can reach without walking through any grass, and the only one with a Weedle as his second Pokemon. Due to the way that damage is calculated, Poison Sting actually deals more minimum damage than Tackle, which guarantees that Weedle will defeat even the strongest level 30 Charmanders that Caterpies won't. Weedle also learns String Shot, but Doug's AI is programmed not to use it if it won't lower the enemy's speed anymore, which means if it hits 6 times, he'll only use Poison Sting. String Shot actually has a 5% chance to miss, but over 40 turns of Growling, the probability that String Shot misses enough times to make a difference is so astronomically low that I don't even consider it a real possibility. To summarize, starting inside the Pokemon Center, I walk up to Doug in Viridian Forest, avoiding any grass. I then use Ember once on his first Weedle for a cool 78 experience, and then Growl at his second Weedle 40 times in a row. Since using Growl only requires me to press A, even if Charmander faints early due to poison or crits, I'll just end up in the Pokemon Center talking to Nurse Joy for the remainder of the 40 growls. By the end of the sequence of inputs, I'm guaranteed to be standing in front of Nurse Joy and can restart the cycle. On the way to level 31, Charmander learns three moves, Metal Claw, Smoke Screen, and Scary Face, all three of which are useless to me. Metal Claw is learned automatically since Charmander has an open slot, so there's no extra inputs needed. But for Smokescreen and Scary Face, I need to keep very close track of which Doug cycle I'm currently on. Level 6 Charmander learns Smokescreen on cycle 50, and level 5 Charmander learns it on cycle 51. I can use this knowledge to ensure that both make it through the menu without learning Smokescreen. I can then do the same thing for Scary Face on cycle 142 and 143, and from there there's only 160 cycles to go. During this process, Charmander is poised to evolve into Charmeleon starting at level 16. Conveniently, when you lose a battle, you don't evolve even if you gained a level, which means there are no extra inputs needed to prevent Charmander from evolving while we train. The reason I don't want Charmander evolving is because Charmeleon learns Flamethrower at level 34 instead of level 31. Despite only being a 3 level difference, it would take 112 extra Doug Cycles, or an additional 15 hours, to get those 3 levels. After about 40 hours of losing to Doug, I know exactly how much experience both level 5 and level 6 Charmander have, and can coordinate learning Flamethrower and evolving on the same Doug Cycle. Level 6 Charmander learns Flamethrower after defeating the first Weedle. By opening the bag, I can prevent any inputs from messing up level 5 Charmander. Then, I can Ember Doug's second Weedle, which has been a long time coming. This causes level 5 Charmander to learn Flamethrower, and I can use the same technique to stall until both parallel universes sync back up. With one more Ember, I finally defeat Doug, thank him for his service and get to watch Charmander evolve. Finally, I'm ready to take on Brock. Moving on to Pewter City is a little bittersweet. After all, I've spent a huge portion of this game's total runtime just losing to Doug, but it's all worth it to be able to have an 100% chance to beat Brock. Just as planned, Flamethrower takes out Geodude and Onyx in one hit, and I get the first badge of the game. Afterwards, I head to the Mart and buy some repels. From this point on, I will never encounter a wild Pokemon again. With Charmeleon so overleveled, I can easily make my way through Route 3 and towards Mount Moon. None of the trainers on this route move around, so I know exactly when the battles happen, and Charmeleon can flamethrower everything for an easy victory. 
I make a quick stop at the Pokemon Center before going into Mount Moon to pick up the second member of the team, Magikarp. You can buy a Magikarp from the salesman in this Pokemon Center for 500 Poke Dollars, which is almost exactly how much I have. Since trainer battles always give the same amount of money, I'll always have enough to buy one. Though Magikarp will be staying in the PC until I can train it. You also might notice that I reset my start menu since I'll be accessing my bag soon to use a repel. But before we delve into this new post dug world, there's a couple of things that I'd like to cover that I've been glossing over for a while. In order to navigate the overworld, I need to be aware of NPCs, especially the ones that move, since I could potentially bump into them without knowing it. There are four different types of NPCs. Stationary, which don't move our turn. Turning, which don't move but turn around randomly. Mobile, which move around in a set path. And wandering, which walk around randomly. Of the four, stationary is the easiest to deal with. I always know their location, and I always know when a battle with them will start, so long as I know my current position. Mobile NPCs are similarly easy to deal with. They always move in the same path, so they're easy to avoid. For trainers that I can't avoid, I can just wait outside their patrol route until they notice me and start a battle. For turning NPCs, I can approach them from outside their view, and when I step in front of them, either they're looking directly at me and a battle starts immediately, or I turn towards them and press A to start the battle myself. Regardless, both battles start, and when they finish, all I have to do is move in a direction that neither parallel universe is currently facing to sync them back up. Wandering NPCs are hazardous, and I avoid them if I can. They can only wander in a finite rectangle space, so for the most part I can just walk around them. There's actually only one wandering NPC in the entire game that I can't avoid, and that's this guy. More on him later. But if you see me walking around weirdly, it's likely to avoid a wandering NPC. Wandering and turning NPCs have an additional issue. If I apply a repel, I get 100 steps before I need to reapply it. But if I step onto a tile and an NPC is looking directly at it, that step doesn't count. This discrepancy causes the repels to run out at different times. which means I have to apply Repel, then take a step, then apply another Repel, just in case. For every turning or wandering trainer I'm forced to battle, I have to take an additional step and apply another Repel. Once I no longer need a Repel active, I can let all the Repels run out one step at a time, and everything gets synced back up. With all this in mind, I can pass through Mount Moon without worrying about wild Pokemon and pick up this rare candy. Some trainers have a Rattata that knows Quick Attack, and priority moves like Quick Attack can be an issue, but for right now, they don't deal enough damage to actually be threatening, so I can just ignore them. When I arrive in Cerulean City, I finally gain access to the most important resource of this run. The daycare gives me access to consistent experience, without the pain of having to fight a trainer hundreds of times in a row. Pokemon in the daycare gain one experience per step taken. If I know how long a straightaway is, then I can run back and forth across it and know exactly how much experience is gained. Using the daycare, I can level up as much as I want. What would take Doug 40 hours takes the daycare only one. But because experience requirements grow exponentially, I'd like to avoid spending unnecessary time in the daycare. Even though I could level every Pokemon on my team to 100, my goal is to keep my team's overall level as low as possible. Before I can drop anybody off in the daycare though, I need money. Leveling up in the daycare costs quite a bit, and I don't have any source of money beyond trainer battles, which won't be enough to pay for the levels I need. Luckily, there's a sneaky way to get a lot of money. On Route 24, there's a trainer that gives you a nugget when you start a battle with him. Due to an oversight in the code, you can actually get infinite nuggets from him, so long as you never defeat him. So, for the second time this game, it's time to intentionally lose to a trainer many times in a row. This time will be much shorter though, and by the end I'll have all the money I need for the rest of the game. The trainer's AI is more advanced than Doug, and I only need to do this cycle 31 times, 
At 16 splashes per cycle, the total time to complete is only 4 hours. Before I begin the cycle, I put Charmeleon in the PC and take Magikarp out since Magikarp is a much lower level and will die faster. Then, starting in front of Nurse Joy, I walk out of the Pokemon Center and to the Nugget Trainer who gives me a Nugget before we start battling. Ekans is guaranteed to win in 16 turns, so I just splash until I lose, then restart the cycle from the beginning. Just like with Doug, Extra splash inputs just cause me to talk to Nurse Joy until it's time to start the loop again. By the end of all this, I'll have 31 nuggets, which amounts to 155,000 Poké Dollars. This easily pays for the daycare, but I actually need the majority of this money to purchase coins at the casino, which sells important prizes. But before we get to all that, I'll need to defeat Misty first. Misty has a level 21 Starmie that knows Water Pulse. Since Water Pulse confuses, I'll have to end the battle in one turn. Confusion, much like other status effects, introduces too much random chance to reliably win any battle. To defeat Starmie in one hit, Charmeleon will need to evolve and hit level 48, but I'm actually going to train all the way to level 54 in anticipation of a fight in the Elite Four. Before I head to the daycare, I grab another rare candy and hit level 34 on both parallel universes. Then, I use two rare candies on Charmeleon. This actually syncs these two parallel universes back up, since rare candies resolve the 70 experience difference between them by not carrying over any leftover experience. That said, I'm still going to show both games to help showcase any subtle differences between them. After a short detour, I drop Charizard off at the daycare to train. It will only take about 4.5 hours to get to level 54. During this time, Charizard learns Slash and Dragon Rage automatically, which will replace Ember and Growl. A couple of hours later, Charizard comes out of the daycare and Magikarp goes in. I need to get Magikarp to level 55, which will take about 8 hours thanks to Magikarp having naturally slow experience gain. Afterwards, I can use a rare candy to evolve into Gyarados, which will help me defeat Giovanni's ground types later. Upon finishing Magikarp's training, I head to the Mart to sell all 31 nuggets, which will provide the necessary money to pay for the daycare. Then, I grab a hidden rare candy and use it to evolve into Gyarados, but I won't be needing Gyarados for a while, so They'll be staying in the PC again. Finally, I can head to the gym and defeat Misty with Charizard. Next up is Vermilion City, which I can get to without much trouble at all. I pick up the Cut HM on the SS Anne and then head to a Mart to buy enough repels to last me the rest of the game. After buying my repels and teaching Charizard Cut, I can head to the Vermilion Gym, which has a slightly problematic puzzle. In order to face the gym leader, you need to open the gate by finding two switches hidden inside these 15 trash cans. The first switch is hidden randomly among the cans, and the second switch is hidden in a can directly adjacent to the first one. If you guess wrong on the second switch, the puzzle resets. To do this, I simply check every trash can once. Doing this guarantees I find the first switch. By checking the cans in this snake pattern, I'll always check an adjacent can next, which means that every time I do a loop, I've at least attempted to find the second switch once. I have to check one extra can in case the first switch is located in the 15th trash can, but then I can exit the gym to reset the puzzle and try again. Even in the worst case scenario, each loop gives me a 25% chance of success. I do this loop 80 times, which nearly guarantees success. After about 30 minutes, I finish cycling and face Lieutenant Surge, who is easily defeated by an overleveled Charizard. Next, I have to go to Saladon City to face Erika, the Grass Gym Leader, for the fourth badge. Charizard needs no extra training or preparation to take this gym on, so I can head there without stopping. I can pass through Rock Tunnel, with no need for Flash, for obvious reasons, 
and along the way, Charizard can easily handle every trainer battle. It's all very similar to Mount Moon. Soon enough, I make it to Celadon and get the Rainbow Badge with ease. Before I can move on though, I have a couple errands to run. First, I pick up the third member of the team from a table on the roof of this building. Then, I teach Gyarados Water Pulse and head to the department store to buy a Thunderstone, which I'll be using to evolve Eevee into Jolteon. I make a quick stop at the casino to go into the Rocket Hideout, where I face Giovanni for the first time. Then, I head back into the casino to spend my nugget money on coins, which I can then use to buy two important prizes, the TM for Thunderbolt and an Abra, the fourth member of the team, though I won't be training Abra at all. Now, it's time to train Eevee in the daycare in preparation for the Elite Four. Between here and the Champion, there's quite a few more gyms and tough trainer battles, but it would take forever to talk about all of them. Instead, I'd like to give you an in-depth look at just one of these battles, to give a sense of what battles look like when I can't one-hit KO every Pokémon. Before we get to the battle, Eevee needs to be trained. This time, it will take a brief 24 hours, and I'll be training Eevee to level 87. Then, I'll use a Thunderstone to evolve into Jolteon, which has the high speed and attack stats needed to succeed. Jolteon can be taught Thunderbolt through the TM that I bought, and will be the main source of damage on the team from now on. When Jolteon's training finally finishes, I can head to Lavender Town and climb Pokemon Tower for the Pokeflute. Then, I head to Sylphco, where I face off against my rival and talk to this scientist to pick up the fifth member of the team, Lapras. Much like Abra, I also won't be training Lapras at all. For most of this game, my Pokémon have been overleveled, but Giovanni represents the first major battle that I can't just bulldoze through, and the first major battle where it's not necessary to one-hit KO every enemy Pokémon. At the start of the battle, Jolteon takes down Nidorino with Thunderbolt. But then the problems begin when Giovanni sends out Nidoqueen. Jolteon is unable to one-hit KO Nidoqueen, and Nidoqueen knows Body Slam, which can paralyze. Paralysis is not a condition I can deal with, since it could cause me to skip a turn, and I wouldn't know it. I can't afford to let Jolteon get paralyzed, so I send out Charizard instead. Charizard also can't one-hit KO Nidoqueen, but Flamethrower will lower Nidoqueen's health enough that Gyarados can take care of the rest. But this is where things get tricky. Flamethrower can either do a normal amount of damage and leave Nidoqueen alive, or it could crit and KO Nidoqueen. Or it could burn Nidoqueen and leave her alive. Or, if it's a particularly strong Charizard, it could burn and then the burn could KO Nidoqueen. Meanwhile, Charizard is potentially paralyzed, which forces a switch. Switching Pokemon takes a turn, which means I can't just send Gyarados out immediately or I'll just get paralyzed again. To take initiative back, I need one of my Pokemon to faint, which will let me send out a new one for free. I could send out Abra, since Abra is the lowest level and would faint the quickest, but I actually have to send out Lapras. This is because the AI is programmed to prefer sending out Pokemon with a super effective move against your current battler, and I need Giovanni to send Rhyhorn out after Nidoqueen. But there's another problem. In two of these scenarios, Nidoqueen has already fainted. These two scenarios are functionally identical though, and can be treated as one. In this case, I can use the text prompts from Nidoqueen fainting to prevent directional inputs from affecting this scenario while I send out Lapras in the others. Once Lapras is out, I only need to press A to use Mist while I stall for 16 turns, the maximum number of turns the strongest Lapras could survive versus the unluckiest Nidoqueen. In the cases where Nidoqueen has already fainted, pressing A opens the Pokemon menu and continually attempts to swap out Charizard, which the game will not allow. This causes a loop. Meanwhile, in the scenario where Nidoqueen is burned, there's a chance the burn KOs on the first or second turn, and Lapras survives. Since I'm just pressing A during this time, I don't have to worry too much, as I will just open the Pokemon menu and enter another loop, keeping this scenario stalled. In the final scenario, 
Lapras stalls and faints as planned, and all three parallel universes end up on the Pokemon select screen, though they are all slightly different. When the 16 turns are up, I want to send out Gyarados, either to finish off Nidoqueen or to KO Rhyhorn, but there's an additional two scenarios that I have to deal with. Depending on the turn Lapras faints, the current state of the menu could be different. Either there's no menu, a text box, or the shift menu currently open. I can use the following button sequence to resolve all five scenarios. Press down three times to get non-menu scenarios selecting Gyarados and menu scenarios on cancel. Text box scenarios are unaffected by directional inputs. Then, press A twice, which either sends out Gyarados closes the text box and opens the shift menu, or closes the shift menu and reopens it, syncing these two scenarios. Next, I press B to close out of the menu, followed by down three times to select Gyarados. If Gyarados is already out, B does nothing, and down inputs bring the cursor to Pokemon. Then, I can press A twice to send out Gyarados. This opens the Pokemon menu and the Shift menu in the first scenario, but with only a couple extra B inputs to close out of the menus, and an UP input to move from Pokemon to fight in the first scenario, the discrepancies are resolved, and I can continue with the original three scenarios. I can have Gyarados use Water Pulse regardless of the scenario, since it will finish off a weakened Nidoqueen and one-hit KO Rhyhorn. Either way, I can press B through the text prompts and say no to switching, since I need Gyarados to deal with Rhyhorn in this scenario. Against Genghis Khan, using Water Pulse could potentially KO if it confuses and crits. Once again, I can use the text prompts to prevent a down input from affecting these two scenarios while I get in position to swap Jolteon out in the third. I can press A several times to advance text prompts while stalling, and then when I'm ready, I can send out Jolteon in both of these scenarios. There's actually a bonus scenario here, since Genghis Khan knows Fake Out, which is a priority move and a guaranteed flinch, but only on the first turn the user is out. I can use Thunderbolt in all three scenarios, but I might get flinched. Though, in the other scenarios, this is guaranteed to end the fight. I press B a bunch to finish off the text prompts and sync these three scenarios. Then, I can use Thunderbolt again since Fake Out can't be used twice, and end the fight in this last one. The A and B inputs don't affect the other scenarios at all. With a couple more B inputs, everything is synced back up, and Giovanni is defeated. Well, actually, there's six unique parallel universes at the end of this fight. Depending on the circumstances, the experience from Nidoqueen could go to Charizard, Lapras, or Gyarados, creating a three-way discrepancy. Then, the experience from Kangaskhan could go to either Gyarados, or Jolteon. Together, this creates six unique scenarios, which I have to keep in mind from this point on. There's also one other scenario we didn't talk about, which is if Charizard gets poisoned versus Nidoqueen. Since poison continues to deal damage in the overworld, I don't want to get interrupted by a text prompt telling me Charizard has fainted while walking around. So I quickly run back and forth in this hallway to force any poison Charizards to faint before aligning myself against a wall to sync up and then move on. Though there are six parallel universes active, there's really only two that matter. The ones where Jolteon got the experience for Kangaskhan, and the ones where Jolteon didn't. So I'll be showing those two, but keeping all six in mind. With Giovanni out of the way, I talk to the Silph Co. president to get the Master Ball, which will allow me to actually catch a Pokemon, so long as I can guarantee an encounter with it. I'll be using the Master Ball to capture Articuno, since I need an Ice-type to deal with Dragon and Ground-types. Once I capture Articuno, my team will be complete, and I'll be ready to face the Elite Four. But until then, there's still four gyms to deal with.
Finally, we make it to this NPC, who you might remember from before. There's actually only one wandering NPC in the entire game that I can't avoid, and that's this guy. More on him later. Well, it's later. There are indeed other wandering NPCs in the game, but I can outright avoid all of them. In fact, this bridge has so many wandering trainers on it that navigating it would be impossible. Though, I never have to cross this bridge, so I don't have to deal with them. To deal with this trainer, I walk next to his rectangle boundary and towards the wall. If a battle starts, I can defeat him without any directional inputs by just pressing A and B to use Thunderbolt, while scenarios where I don't fight him stand patiently by the wall. When the fight is over, I can move right until both scenarios are against the wall, and then continue, keeping in mind the extra experience Jolteon received from the fight and that my repel is now one step off between scenarios. When I go to fight Blaine, Jolteon is either level 89 or 90, and can level up after Growlithe or Ponyta, so I need to be prepared to handle the level up prompts for both. But other than that, Blaine goes down smoothly. I head to the daycare for the last time to train Articuno. Articuno will be brought to level 65 in preparation of taking down Lance's Dragonite. This will also make the next fight with Giovanni at the 8th gym much easier than the last one. Before I go to the last gym, I make a pit stop to grab this Chesto Berry, which is a 10 hour time save. Then I go back to the casino to spend the rest of my cash on TM30, Shadow Ball, which I'll be teaching to Jolteon. Articuno takes care of Giovanni, earning me the 8th and final gym badge. Finally, after preparing for it all game, I can go and challenge the Elite Four. To begin, I buy a couple full restores, being mindful of the 3,000 missing Poké Dollars in scenarios that didn't fight the wandering NPC. Then, it's time to face Lorelei. Her team is mostly water types, which makes things easy for Jolteon. Though Jolteon can one-hit KO all of Lorelei's Pokémon, Cloyster knows Protect, which can block Thunderbolt. Luckily, Lorelei's AI is programmed not to use it more than twice. I can use the same Pokémon menu stalling tactic from Giovanni to guarantee Cloyster is defeated before moving on and assume that I've used up two extra Thunderbolts of my 15 total. The rest of Lorelei's Pokemon go down in one hit. Jinx needs to be taken out with Shadow Ball, since Jinx's special defense is high enough that Thunderbolt and Bite don't do the job, and Ghost-type moves are physical in Gen 3, but with that, Lorelei is defeated. Next up is Bruno. After the Lorelei fight, Jolteon is guaranteed to be level 91, so I can finally use a couple rare candies to reach level 95 and sink the discrepancies with Jolteon's XP. Articuno and Jolteon trade off on Onyx and Hitmonchan, but I can't one-hit KO Machamp. There's no need for any parallel universes though, as Machamp can't inflict any statuses, and even a cross-chop crit won't KO Jolteon. With Quick Attack lowering Machamp's health, Jolteon can use Thunderbolt to finish them off. Even if Machamp used Scary Face and halved my speed, the slowest Jolteon is still faster than Hitmonlee by a slim margin. With one more Thunderbolt, I defeat Bruno, and afterward, I use a full restore to heal any Jolteons that were potentially hit by Cross Chop. Nothing happens to Jolteons that took no damage. Next up is Agatha, whose Ghost and Poison types have low enough defense stats that Jolteon can bite and Thunderbolt through her Pokemon. With no priority moves on her team, she's defeated without an issue, and I move on to face Lance. Before the fight, I give Articuno my last rare candy to ensure we're faster than Lance's Dragonite. Much like Agatha, all of Lance's Pokemon go down in one hit. It might not seem necessary, since Lance's Pokemon don't know many status moves, unlike Agatha's Hypnosis and Confuse Rays, but by the time Articuno can survive a Hyper Beam crit, it's already at a level that it can one-hit Dragonite and Dragonair anyway. 
By the same token, Jolteon would go down to a Dragonite Hyper Beam crit, even at level 100. With Lance defeated, there's only the champion left, my rival Dave. Before I head into his chamber, I use an elixir on Jolteon to restore Thunderbolt and give Jolteon the 10 hour time save Chestoberry. But after that, I'm ready to take on Dave. To start the battle, Jolteon one-hit KO's Pidgeot with Thunderbolt. Rhydon comes out next, and I send out Articuno for another one-hit KO. But then Dave wants to send out Arcanine. I can't one-hit KO Arcanine, and a flamethrower crit that burns followed by an extreme speed crit is lethal to Jolteon. Just like with Giovanni's Needle Queen, I'll need to have somebody else deal a little bit of damage and then have one of my Pokemon faint so I can send in Jolteon for the kill. But there's a new issue. Unlike Giovanni, Dave has access to full restores, which up until this point haven't been relevant. Dave is guaranteed to use a full restore if any of his Pokemon fall below 25% health, which means that in addition to dealing more than 14% damage, I also need to deal less than 75% damage. This is actually quite difficult. For example, the weakest Gyarados using Water Pulse will deal a minimum of 22% of Arcanine's health, and the strongest Gyarados will deal 78% on a crit bringing it just over the limit. Charizard, however, is the correct level to do it with Wing Attack. But there's one last problem. Arcanine has the Intimidate ability, which will reduce my attack stat. In Gen 3, crits ignore reduced stats. So while this lowers the minimum damage I can do, it doesn't affect the maximum, effectively increasing the spread of damage beyond what I can handle. Intimidate only activates once when a Pokemon is switched in, so to deal with this, I send in Lapras first to get intimidated. I only need to stall for two turns to let Lapras faint since extreme speed might not KO on the first turn. And in case you're wondering, Dave's AI won't use Roar unless I start raising my stats, so I don't have to worry about that. After Lapras faints, I send in Charizard to use Wing Attack. Charizard is faster than Arcanine and can survive an extreme speed crit, so nothing can stop me from dealing the necessary 17 to 57% damage. Charizard doesn't know any non-damaging moves, so I swap in Abra to instantly faint, giving me the opportunity to send out Jolteon for free. Arcanine could use extreme speed here, but it won't do enough damage to matter. Thunderbolt deals at least 86% of Arcanine's health for the KO, and Dave sends out Alakazam, but with an incredibly low defense stat, a single Shadow Ball will take it out. Next up, Dave sends out Executor, which Jolteon also can't KO, but this time, I don't have to worry about any priority moves like Extreme Speed. There are five possibilities at the start of this fight. Executor can use Egg Bomb, Giga Drain, Sleep Powder, light screen, or I could just KO on the first turn. If we don't KO with Bite, it will at a minimum put Executor into full restore range, even on a Giga Drain crit. While Dave uses a full restore, I get a free turn, and since my Chestoberry kept me from being asleep, I don't have to spend an extra 10 hours training in the daycare for the one hit KO. Due to scenarios where light screen is active, I can't use Bite or Thunderbolt since their damage is halved, but Shadow Ball deals physical damage, and it deals 51% of Executor's health at a minimum. So long as I keep using Shadow Ball, Executor will either faint, or Dave will just continuously use full restores, of which he has a maximum of 4. Once the full restores run out, Shadow Ball will KO for sure in 2 turns at most, and since I'm just pressing A this whole time to use Shadow Ball, all the scenarios end up stalled on the Pokemon Switch screen at the end. Dave has to send out Blastoise next, which Jolteon could one-hit KO if it weren't for the light screen. I need to wait a couple of turns for it to go away, and so I want to send out Gyarados. Just like in the fight with Giovanni, the venues can be in three different states, so I use the same down 3 A down 3 triple A input sequence, which sends out Gyarados in every scenario. 
On the first turn, I use a full restore on Jolteon, but some scenarios have a full health Jolteon and will reopen on the bag menu. This is fine, as I can manipulate the menus to let lagging scenarios catch up. Scenarios still in the bag are one turn behind, so I position the cursor on the run option in the menu, then press B to close the bag. This lets me stall scenarios that have already completed this turn, while the others use splash. Then I just have to close the menu and make sure all the possible Gyaradoses are on the fight menu and selecting splash, and I'll finally be synced up. There's a chance Gyarados faints here, but it doesn't matter, as a full health Jolteon can take a crit from a Rain Dance boosted Hydro Pump anyway. Light Screen is guaranteed to be over at this point, which means Jolteon can use Thunderbolt to end the fight. From here, all I have to do is press B to advance text boxes. At a cool 270 hour total runtime, the game is finally over.